Thank you very much, Gord, for the introduction. As Gord said, my name is Catherine Cernuka, and I'm a lawyer at Learners in London, Ontario. Um, I'm going to give a general introduction, basically, on estate planning and go over a few general aspects. And then I'm going to get a bit more specific talking about wills and about powers of attorney. And I'm going to leave some time at the end to talk about some questions as well. If any of you have questions, please let me know, and I'll do my best to answer them at the end. I have to balance my binder and the, the laptop, so bear with me. Now, when I refer to, re refer to estate planning, I'm not just talking about what it is that you pass along on your death. I'm talking about the process of organizing all of your assets during your lifetime in order to meet your needs. Okay, sure, thank you. So having a proper estate plan allows you to effectively plan your estate, determine who's going to receive your assets, and also consider potential tax consequences and address those issues up front. Now, your estate consists of all of the assets that you own at any given time. It's a total of real estate. It could involve investments, RRSPs, um, and any assets that you own during your lifetime. Now, your estate is always changing. Um, your assets may come and go throughout your lifetime. So you may have a cottage right now, but maybe you don't use your cottage as often as you thought, so you might determine that you're going to sell your cottage so you won't have the cottage at the time of your death. Or maybe you're living in a house that's, that's small right now and your family is going to be expanding, or if your family is going to be um, moving away, then you might want to move into a smaller home. So your assets aren't always going to be the same as they are now um, as when you pass away. Now the way to protect your assets in your lifetime is through something called powers of attorney. Now there are two types of powers of attorney. One of them is power of attorney for personal care and the other one is a power of attorney for property. The power of attorney generally allows you during your lifetime to give another person the authority to act on your behalf in certain situations. In estate planning, we use the power of attorney for, to plan for incapacity that may result from illness or may result from an accident or something that may happen to you. Now, you can appoint someone to take care of your finances um, in the event that you ever do become incapacitated. The power of attorney for personal care applies to the things that you would assume under a power of attorney for personal care. It applies to health, matters of um, well-being, medical decisions that have to be made, you can appoint somebody to act in your place to make those decisions for you. Now, there's also something called a living will, and I'm going to go into that in a little bit of detail later on in the presentation, and that is basically um, a health directive, so it gives people an idea of what you would do in certain situations if your health ever declines. Now, each estate and each estate plan is very different depending on the unique situation of the person. Your will and your estate plan should be designed to keep those unique situations in mind and to address your individual needs and your individual circumstances. There's no one shoe fits all or one size fits all uh, estate plan. It's custom tailored to each individual circumstance. Having your estate plan up to date ensures that your assets are distributed according to the way that you would want them distributed and not left to the law to determine who gets all of your assets. Now, it's important to consider what goals you want to achieve in your estate plan. There's a number of considerations and questions that you should be asking yourself. Some of them are, um, who do you want your estate to benefit? Is there one person in particular, or would you like it to benefit a number of people? Do you have any dependents who might have special needs that you would like to care for after your death? Are there any trusts that you'd like to establish? If you have children or grandchildren who are minors, you might be concerned that they would spend all of their money all at once if they're only 18. You might want to determine that they have to be 30 or 35 before they can inherit their benefit, their benefit under the will. Now, some other important considerations are some implications and issues that might arise with blended families. So if you and your spouse have kids from a previous relationship or from a previous marriage, there's some different considerations that have to be made in that situation rather than the traditional family, which would be two spouses with kids only with each other. Do you own a business? Do you have any business interests that you'd like to protect in your estate plan? 
do you have a cottage? If you have a cottage, you might want to think of who will inherit your cottage. If you name a number of people to inherit your cottage, do you want to say how often they can visit the cottage? Would you like to come up with a schedule of when they can use the cottage, or would you just like them to figure that out? Do you donate to charities in your lifetime, and would you like those charities to continue to benefit even after your death? Now, what happens if you have children and you leave your estate to your children, but one of those children dies before you do? What would you like to have happen to their share? Would you like it to go to your remaining children or would you like it to go to their children if they have any? Now, a proper estate plan, as I said, will ensure that all of those assets are taken care of. Otherwise, Ontario legislation will determine what happens to your assets. Now, what is a will? A will is a document, essentially, that sets out all of your wishes for the distribution of your property and your assets on your death. There are certain rules and requirements in order for a will to be valid. If you don't have a will, or if your will is determined not to be valid, the provincial law will determine who will get your estate. Wills are revocable, so if you have a will drafted, you can change your mind. You can revoke that will and replace it with another will, or you can change that will as well. If you have a lot of changes that you'd like to be made to your will, then we might suggest drafting an entirely new will. Otherwise, if there are small changes, we can just draft a separate document that's attached to that will that's called a codicil, and then it wouldn't have to redraft the entire will. If you have a will gifting specific assets to specific people, you're still free to do whatever you want with those assets. So, for instance, my will says that I have a piano and I would like my piano to be given to my sister. That's not to say that if in a couple years I decide I want to sell that piano, I can't just because I have it named in my will. I can do whatever I want with it. Now, I'm going to be using the word testator in my presentation. By testator, I just mean the person whose will it is. So my husband's will, my husband is the testator. Now, for a will to be valid, a testator has to have capacity to create the will and to understand what it is that they are doing when they draft the will. If the person doesn't have capacity, they aren't able to properly give instructions, and they're not able to fully understand the implications of their will. Also, there are requirements with respect to the witnessing of the will. So if the will isn't witnessed properly, then the will may not be valid on your death. Now I have on there disclosure and analysis of all assets. So when you die, all of your assets are disclosed and your estate trustee learns of everything, all of your secrets, everything that you have hiding, they all come out of the woodwork. So your estate trustee will discover everything that you own because they have to disclose all of those assets to the government for tax purposes. Some people don't know this, but marriage uh, actually revokes a will. There are certain events that revoke a will and marriage is one of them. So if you have a previously made will and then you get married, that previously made will is no longer valid and you have to have a new will. Otherwise, if you don't, you would die without a will. The only exception to that is if you have a will drafted that contemplates or acknowledges the marriage that you're going to be entering into. So if the will specifically says, I'm making this will in contemplation of marriage to this person, then that will will remain valid even after you get married. Now, it can't just be a general statement. You have to have your eye on the prize. You have to have somebody that you've listed as a person you're going to be marrying. You can't just say, I'm going to get married one day, and I don't want this will to be revoked. It has to be very specific. Now, divorce does not automatically revoke your will, but it does affect it in certain ways. So your former spouse is treated as though they predeceased the testator, but some of the other provisions that don't affect the former spouse and that don't involve the former spouse remain valid. Any gift that is given to your former spouse may be invalidated by the divorce. Um, and if the former spouse was named as the estate trustee, then that gets revoked and it falls to the next person that you have listed for estate trustee. Now, if property is owned jointly, so if someone else is on the title of the property with you, even if you get divorced, that person on title will still receive the property. So if you do get divorced and you own a house jointly with your former spouse, unless you want them receiving that property, you have to change, um, change title. 
Now, unlike divorce, separation doesn't affect your will. If you and your spouse are separated at the time of your death, your spouse may still receive your property under the will. The surviving spouse will still be entitled to your assets unless the will has been changed. Now, there are a number of advantages to having a will, and I'm going to go over a few of those today. It allows you to choose someone as your estate trustee rather than having the court appoint someone. So I'm sure many of you know this because some of you may have acted as a state trustee for an estate. Uh, but for those of you who aren't familiar with the term, a state trustee or executor, the two terms are interchangeable, that means the same thing, is the person that you name in your will to administer your estate upon death. Now administering an estate means making sure all of the taxes are paid, all of the gifts are given to the beneficiaries under the will, and just making sure that the will is followed, all the proper filings are filed with the government, etc. Now, a lot of people believe that the highest honor that they can give someone is to appoint them as a state trustee, but that view isn't often shared with the person acting as a state trustee. There's a lot of time, a lot of effort, and a lot of stress associated with acting as an estate trustee. The person you name should be someone who's responsible, um, who's organized, most importantly, and who's knowledgeable, and also has the time necessary to devote to administering an estate. Some people uh, choose a professional to act as an estate trustee as an alternate, so they might appoint a lawyer or a trust company to act as a state trustee or an accountant. Um, it's important to keep in mind, though, that there's often a professional fee associated with having a professional act as a state trustee, and that fee will come out of your estate. The responsibilities of the estate trustee are very extensive. Um, it's possible for the estate trustee to be held liable and responsible to the estate and to the beneficiaries if they don't administer the estate properly. Some of the duties of the estate trustee are they have to actually locate the will. Um, some people actually keep their will in the freezer, which I find is kind of strange, but they say that the fridge is going to be cleaned out anyway after you die, so somebody's going to stumble across your will. I don't recommend keeping it in the freezer. Um, consulting with a lawyer to determine if there are any legal issues. So an estate trustee, advise, it's advised that they consult a lawyer to talk about any issues that might be coming up in their will, in the will that they're administering. They also have to meet with the beneficiaries and also protect all of the assets in the estate. If there are any trusts that are established in the will, then they'll have to manage those trusts as well. Now, the estate trustee also has to value all of the assets. The government needs to know the value of the deceased person's estate. So they have to go through all of the assets, uh, assign a value to those assets, and then file the appropriate filings with the government. They also have to take care of tax issues with the estate um, and file a final tax return for the deceased person. And finally, they have to make sure that all of the gifts that are given in the will to the beneficiaries are actually paid out accordingly. Now, if you don't have a will, it's necessary for somebody to apply to the court to become an estate trustee. You don't get to choose who that person is, and the court will likely appoint the next of kin. But the next of kin may not be somebody that you would have appointed as a, a state trustee. So maybe they're not very responsible, or maybe they're not organized, and that wouldn't have been your first choice. So it's always better to have a will to make sure that you can choose who that person is going to be, and you can also list an alternate person so that in case the first choice that you've made is unable to act or they refuse to act, you've got an alternate in place. Now, during my client meetings, I'm often asked for guidance on how to choose an estate trustee, and there's a few things that you should keep in mind. The age and the health of the person that you choose is very important. If the person has health issues, it may be difficult for them to actually do the job. If the person is significantly older, they may not be around at the time of your death, and if they are, they may not be able to actually administer the estate. The person's relationship to you is also very important. If they're a close relative, you have to consider whether or not they are going to be able to administer the estate properly in a time that's going to be very emotional and stressful for them. Further, you have to consider if the person you choose, if they're very close to you, can they remain impartial and fair with all of the beneficiaries. Where the person lives is also important to keep in mind. If the person has to travel a far distance to administer your estate, they may decide that they don't want to do it and it may be quite a burden for them if they do. 
Now another benefit of having your will is you can choose the beneficiary. So you can determine who's going to inherit, inherit your estate and what portions are going to inherit the estate in. I don't have three sisters, but if I did have three sisters, um, I would want to leave everything to them after my husband, if my husband wasn't able to inherit. But maybe I would want to leave more to one sister than the other two. In my will, I could specify that. Whereas if I don't have a will, the rules of the laws of Ontario may not give anything to my sisters, and if they do, maybe they wouldn't be inheriting what I want them to inherit. Now, a will also allows you to create trusts, which you wouldn't be able to do without a will. A trust, in general terms, is a legal relationship where one person, known as the trustee, manages all of the assets of the trust for the benefit of another person. Those people are known as the beneficiaries. There are different types of trust that you can establish in your will. You can establish a house trust, so you can give your house to one person for as long as that person lives, and when that person dies, that house can go to somebody else. Or if I leave my estate to my children, I can specify that my children have to reach a certain age before they inherit, because maybe they're gonna be wild and maybe they're not gonna be responsible when they're 18 or 20, so I might wanna say 30 or 35. Now, the difference between a will and a trust is that a will essentially hands over assets to the beneficiaries, and a trust can be much more specific about managing and paying out those assets. A trust can also be used in a situation where an adult child maybe has difficulty managing money. If I have a child who has problems with gambling, I may not want to leave a lump sum to them because they may end up spending everything all in one fell swoop and perhaps my intention was to have them benefit for a longer period of time. So I might decide to establish a trust so that a trust can pay out a certain amount of money to them and can control the amount of money they receive. There are some tax planning strategies that can be considered. It all depends on the assets of your estate, so I'm not gonna get into that because it can be quite complicated and we'd probably be here for another hour or two. Um, but probate fees are generally a question that a lot of people have when I'm uh, meeting with them. Probate fees on average are about 1.5% of the entire value of the estate. So everybody wants to avoid probate fees as much as possible, but at the end of the day, it's really not a huge consideration because it's actually quite minimal. Another consideration and advantage of having a will is having a corporate will. So if you own a corporation, you can establish a corporate will or a secondary will. That secondary will would manage the shares of the corporation that you own and it would protect certain assets from probate if they don't need probate. A lot of times, uh, doctors and dentists will have a secondary will because they'll have professional corporations that may benefit from having a secondary will. Now, guardians are another advantage of having a will. If you have children who are minors and you die while your children are still minors, you can appoint people to care, uh, take care of your children while you pass away. A will that is very specific about listing out your intentions can avoid problems or issues that might arise among the survivors. It's very sad, and I see it a lot, it's very sad to see families and siblings torn apart because they don't have a valid will that their parents have left behind, um, and they're fighting over money, and their family relationship breaks down. So if you have a will that's very specific and lays out your intentions, your kids can be mad at you, but what are you gonna do? You're not gonna be around anymore. <laughs> they won't be fighting with each other, and at least you can save that. Now, if you don't have a will, there are some extra costs that are involved. Each application that you have to, uh, that your estate trustee, your potential estate trustee would have to make in order to uh, be appointed as a state trustee is an extra cost. If that person refuses to apply as an estate trustee or if the court doesn't approve that person, um, every application that's made after that is an additional cost. And I've got something called a bond on there. So if you don't have a will um, and somebody applies to be an estate trustee, that person wasn't chosen by the testator. So there is a potential trust issue that's involved, a lack of trust issue. Um, and a bond is required. A bond is usually 1.5 times the value of the estate, so it's quite significant. Uh, we will generally ask the court to waive the bond. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. It just depends on different situations. How do you get a will? A will is only valid if it's in writing. Generally, a will is prepared, usually by a lawyer, hopefully never ever online. 
um, and then signed by the testator and two witnesses. In order for a will to be formally valid, it has to be signed by the person making it, so the testator, and the witnesses have to be uh, not, cannot be beneficiaries who are named in the will. If a beneficiary signs your will as one of your witnesses, then your will will be invalid and it can be challenged. It's, it's very common for wills to be challenged based on their validity, and uh, when a will is challenged, they try to, the person challenging will try to establish that the will isn't valid because of the signature or because of the way that it has been witnessed, so that's a very important consideration. There's no standard will. As I said, there's no one-size-fits-all. You can be as creative you want, as you want, um, put anything you want, you can give any kind of directions that you'd like, uh, and you can be as creative as you want. A lot of people now actually include pet clauses, so uh, it's very common for people to set aside from some money to take care of their beloved animals after they pass away. I had a client who left $100,000 uh, to take care of his horse when he passed away. Another person established a trust for $50,000 for a dog who had some health issues and he wanted to make sure that that dog was taken care of after his death. So that's very common for people to do that. You don't have to give um, if you want to do that, it doesn't have to be 50000 or 100000 It could be as, as little as you want. Now, we often suggest that wills are reviewed every five years or so just to account for a change of circumstances. I'll get into this later on in the presentation, but generally, certain life events can trigger the need for updating your will. For example, if you get married or divorced, as I said, it's a, it's a good idea to revisit your will. If your spouse dies, you may want to revise your will and name a different uh, trustee if you had named your spouse as trustee or a different beneficiary. If your will provides for guardians of minor children, uh, when your children reach the age of majority, you might consider updating your will because they no, no longer need guardians. If you've named executors of your estate or estate trustees of your estate, but maybe you've had a relationship breakdown uh, with that estate trustee or any of the beneficiaries that you've named. Maybe you're not close with them anymore, so you might want to revise your will in that situation. If you've moved to a different country, it's a good idea to talk to a lawyer in that country or a different jurisdiction to make sure that your Ontario will would st still be valid if you own assets in that jurisdiction. Another important factor, as I mentioned, is the capacity of the testator. So the testator has to be able to provide instructions to the lawyer, but they also have to be able to understand the nature and the effect of their will, meaning that the testator has to understand what he's giving away and what property is going to be given away on his death. We also look for, um, when we're assessing capacity, we're also looking for the testator remembering and understanding the kinds of assets that he owns. So if he owns a house, he has to acknowledge that he owns a house and knows that he owns a house. If there are other people on title to the property, if he owns the house with his spouse, he has to know that as well. He also has to know who he has in his life who might expect to inherit something in his will. If he has a number of children who are likely going to expect something from his will, he has to acknowledge that. It doesn't mean he has to leave anything to them, but he has to acknowledge and understand that it is likely that they should be receiving under the under the will if that's something he wants to do. Now in Ontario, I'm gonna go over this very briefly because it's quite, quite detailed, but uh, in Ontario, the Family Law Act, um, a spouse is entitled to property rights and support obligations and that could affect a will. Uh, under the Family Law Act, for property rights, a spouse is defined as two people who are married to each other. But for support purposes, that definition also includes common law spouses. Now, a common law spouse under Ontario law is somebody that you've lived together with for three years. Common law and married uh, spouses can claim spousal support from the estate, but only a married spouse has entitlement to property. So, in other words, the married couple, uh, if one of them dies, the remaining spouse is entitled to the deceased's assets, but the common law spouse is not. Now, I'm going to move on from that and talk about undue influence. Um, a common ground for challenging the validity of a will comes up where a family member of the deceased feels that the deceased was maybe manipulated or pressured into signing the will, and the testator didn't actually understand what the will meant. That is what undue influence is. 
So the issue is actually closely related to mental capacity. Mental capacity of the testator is usually diminished at the time of signing, and that's why they were susceptible to influence from other people. There are a few situations that under influence is uh, something that we, that we notice and that we kind of are, have our minds tuned to. It doesn't mean that undue influence definitely exists in this situation, but um, it's something that, are, that kind of raises a red flag. So in a situation where the deceased was heavily dependent on one family member, like an adult child who was possibly living with them uh, and providing them care before their death, if the other children aren't included in the will, the dependent, uh, the child who is providing um, assistance may have unduly influenced the parent into excluding those other children. Another situation that we are aware of is where the deceased maybe leaves something to somebody that they've only known for a very short time. So that could be a girlfriend, a boyfriend, or a caregiver. The family members who probably would have benefited from the estate might be concerned that that caregiver, for example, unduly influenced or pressured the testator into leaving everything to them. Now we're gonna talk about will kits, and I kind of mentioned my opinion on will kits earlier. Um, I never ever recommend them and my colleagues never recommend them either. If someone asks me why I don't recommend them, my answer is I wouldn't operate on myself. The times we generally see will kits being used are if there is an issue of uh, capacity or if there's something a little fishy that's going on. Um, another situation is if they witness, uh, the witnesses of the will can't be traced and we don't actually know whether or not the will was signed properly. All of the what if and what happens if situations that I talked about before um, that should be considered when you're drafting a will may not have been considered if you're using an online will kit. Often clients come into my office and say, I have a very simple will and it's going to take about 10 minutes to go through everything that I want to talk about. And then after about an hour, once we've talked about all the potential situations that could arise, I have to wait for them to get back to me because maybe they didn't consider the situations that I brought up to them. So a very simple will is not always a simple will. If an estate plan is developed properly and the time is taken to talk through all of those potential situations, the administration of the estate should be very simple and the beneficiaries should be receiving exactly what you want them to receive. If you try to plan your estate your, yourself without any type of professional guidance and you don't consider those situations, the administration might actually be quite difficult and it may end up that either your will is not valid or your beneficiaries may not receive what you wanted them to receive. So I'll talk about a few situations when changes to a will should be considered. As I said, about five years, um, you might want to consider changing your will. Um, under Ontario law, you can name certain people to uh, receive certain financial assets like life insurance and RSPs or pension ben benefits. So we call that a beneficiary designation. Those assets would be paid directly to that person that you've named and they wouldn't fall through your estate, so your will wouldn't govern what happens to those assets. In a situation where two people are married, and both have children from a previous relationship, a person may consider using beneficiary designations as a way to provide for their own, their own children. So if one spouse may decide to leave his or her asset, uh, his or her estate to their surviving second spouse, they may designate their adult children as beneficiaries on their life insurance. Now, there's a special type of trust that can be set up for people with special needs. Before I explain this, I'm going to go into a brief uh, discussion of ODSP benefits in Ontario, but I'll be very brief, I promise. The ODSP uh, benefits in Ontario provides financial assistance to individuals who are eligible to receive them. Some of the main benefits include income support, an allowance for shelter, and a health plan. The amount of financial support that's actually received is dependent on each specific situation. In order to remain eligible to receive those ODSP benefits, there's a limit to the value of assets that that person can own. If someone is receiving ODSP and they get a large inheritance, for example, that large inheritance may reduce or suspend their ODSP benefits if, if it's beyond um, the amount that they're allowed to own. In this situation, the type of trust that would be created, uh, we call it a Henson Trust. 
In a Henson Trust, the trustee has total discretion and total power to decide when and how much the beneficiary is going to receive from the trust. Only those amounts that are actually paid out to the person with disabilities will be included in the person's assets and income to determine whether or not they're entitled to those ODSP benefits. So the whole value of that trust will not be included in determining whether or not the, they're eligible. It's what's actually paid out to that person that gets included. So selecting a trustee to manage this Henson Trust, as you can imagine, is very important. It may be necessary to have more than one trustee in order to operate the trust. So one person might be better at managing a trust and the other person might be better at um, determining how much money is received and figuring out how to support the child in the best way. There are certain rules, as I said, that govern the ODSP benefits and the trustee should be made aware of this. Another situation that trust can be established, we've touched on briefly before, um, it can be established for people who have issues managing money or if the testator is concerned that that money will be spent all at once and they want it to benefit the beneficiary for a while. A lot of people, especially those with children under the age of majority, will establish a trust, as I mentioned, so they could specify a specific age that, that the child will receive those benefits. And I also mentioned the use of trusts for adult children who maybe have difficulty um, handling money. So you can establish a trust that says they're going to get one third of the, val of the um, trust at age 30, another third at 35, and then the remaining amount is going to be given to them at age 40. Now often testators will leave their estate to their children, and if one of their children has predeceased the testator or has died before the testator, that child's share is going to be given to their children if they have any. So the testator's grandchildren, essentially. So as I mentioned, if they are minor children, the grandparents might want to say that their grandchild has to reach 20 or 21 or 25, it can be any age that you want. I drafted a will where they didn't give their uh, share until they were 55, 60, and 65. So they must have been pretty irresponsible. Um, Trust can also be set up with respect to certain situations. So you can say that I'd like so-and-so person to benefit uh, from my estate, and as long as they're enrolled in post-secondary education, um, they're supposed to be given a certain amount of money every year. But once they are no longer enrolled in post-secondary education, the trust will terminate. Now, as I mentioned, the com uh, common belief in Ontario is that common law spouses in Ontario are considered um, to be entitled to their common law partner's estate. That's not true. Um, they may be entitled to support, but they won't be entitled to the property or the assets of their deceased common law spouse. Now, in Ontario, the de definition of marriage and common law is also expanded to include same-sex couples. More frequently than not, I see clients who don't fall into that traditional family mold. Um, so traditional family, I mean uh, two spouses who are married to each other and they only have children with each other, no other children from previous relationships. Common now more than ever um, are clients who come in who have been married before or who have children from a previous relationship and those, the couple is coming together with their own children from a different relationship. So in that situation, there are some different considerations that have to be made. In a traditional family, usually a married couple will leave everything to each other, and if not, um, if that person maybe dies before them, they'll leave them to their children. In a blended family, there are different considerations, as I said. Um, you may want to leave everything to your second spouse, but you also want to benefit your children. So as I said, there are certain situations and uh, certain ways to do that, whether you want to name your children on a life insurance policy and leave the rest of the estate to your spouse, it's something that you want to talk about with the person who's drafting your will. Another challenge that blended families face is determining who the estate trustee is going to be. So the biological children of one spouse might have an issue with the new spouse acting as a state trustee because maybe that new spouse isn't going to have those children's best interests at, in their mind. And same thing for that second spouse. They may not want the biological children of their spouse to be a state trustee because maybe they're not going to consider the second spouse as much as they would have wanted to. Now if you die without a will, that's called dying intestate. The law has assigned the word intestate to mean that um, you die without instructions on what's going to happen to your assets. 
So sometimes a will will be present, but that will may not be valid based on those formalities that we discussed earlier about signing the will and making sure that there is an undue influence that's involved. Now the Succession Law Reform Act is what details who can inherit what if you die without a will. Dying without a will can actually create a lot of problems for those people that you leave behind. Your property may be divided um, and given to people that you wouldn't want to benefit under your will if you were able to make that decision yourself. Also, if you don't have a will, there are going to be some time delays and more costs associated with administering your estate. There's also some tax considerations that could be um, that could stem from, from the assets that you own. Usually when you do an estate plan, you'll talk about some tax issues that may come up, whereas those, those tax issues wouldn't have been addressed if you die without a will. So I don't know if you can uh, read that. It's a bit small, but I'm just going to go over a couple examples. If someone dies without a will and they have a spouse, but they don't have any kids, the spouse will receive the whole property. If the deceased has a spouse and children, but the value of the estate was less than $200,000, the spouse will still get everything. If the deceased has a spouse and children, the, and the value of the estate is more than $200,000, the spouse will be entitled to $200,000, as well as one half of the remainder of whatever's left, and then the remaining amount will be divided among the children. Now this table goes on and on and on to account for different situations. So um, eventually, if you have parents who are still alive, then if you don't have a spouse and kids, it'll go to your parents. If your parents aren't alive, it would go to your siblings. If not your siblings, nieces and nephews, then next of kin. And then if there's nobody that can be tied to you, it goes to the government. And nobody wants that to happen. Now we're going to talk about powers of attorney. I just want to check and see how much time I have. Um, so as I mentioned, these are documents that are uh, in place to plan for incapacity. So I'll go into a little bit more detail now. I just kind of bri briefed on it before. Um, a power of attorney, as I said, meant, uh, plans for any situation that may might arise if you become incapable. So if you have an illness that would render you incapable of making decisions for yourself and of managing your assets, you can appoint a power, of, a power of attorney to manage your assets and your affairs for you. You may want to consider, uh, when you're figuring out who to appoint as your power of attorney, you may want to consider um, the level of trust between you and that person. And you might also want to consider the relationship between you and that person. You can't name somebody who is mentally incapable, and you can also not name somebody who is under the age of 16. A power of attorney for personal care allows you to empower another person to make personal care decisions for you if you cannot do that yourself. So that includes uh, decisions with respect to health care, shelter, uh, the use of life support systems. A living will um, is, and health care directive is, um, it contains wishes that concern your medical treatment when you can no longer communicate those wishes. We incorporate that living will into the power of attorney for personal care and that's um, something that I'm going to go into detail a little bit later. There are some limitations to that. A guardianship allows somebody to manage the affairs of the person who is mentally incapable of doing it. So, for instance, if I was attorney for my mother, and my mother had capacity issues, and she was going around making decisions that were negatively affecting her and hurting her with respect to finances, um, I could firm up that power of attorney and... Uh, it would be uh, turned into a guardianship so that I would be able to control the finances of my mother to prevent her from harming herself financially. The power of attorney or guardian can do anything that the person would do if they were capable of doing that, except for making a will. The power of attorney essentially steps into the shoes of the person, so we call that person a donor. So they step into the shoes of the do donor and make decisions based on the way the donor would have made those decisions themselves. So it's important to talk to the person or people, you can have more than one, that you name as your power of attorney just so that they know what your intentions are if that situation ever comes up. So I'll go into some details on the power of attorney for property. Uh, they are often uh, put in place at the time that your will is drafted. So if we've got clients come in who say they just want a will, I'll often ask, do you have a power of attorney? Um, 
more times than not, people will have a will instead of a power of attorney, so it's important to make sure that all of that is done at once so you have a full and complete estate plan. Now, power of attorneys are only in effect during the lifetime of the donor. Once the donor dies, the estate trustee takes over to, to manage those assets and to take care of the finances and do what needs to be done to administer the estate. Even though you have a power of attorney in place, you can still deal with your assets. Having an attorney act doesn't mean that you can no longer act if you're capable of doing that. Having the document will allow you to determine who you want to be in charge of your property if you become mentally incapable. You can choose one or more friends, relatives, or even a professional attorney such as a trust company to be your power of attorney for property. The types of decisions that a power of attorney for property has to make are decisions relating to finances, such as handling bank accounts, paying bills, signing checks, and making decisions with respect to your home and your possessions. They may determine to buy or sell real estate that you own or deal with any other personal items. If you're going to be out of the country for an extended period of time, or if you become ill, as I said, a power of attorney for property can give your attorney the power to deposit checks and make decisions on your investments and pay your bills while you're away. It's possible to name one person to act as your attorney, or you can uh, choose multiple people to act jointly, or you can specify that those people are to act jointly and severally, which means they can act together when they're able to, and they can act separately if they have to. So if you've named two people as your power of attorney for a property, and one of those people is away traveling, the other person who's, um, who's close to you and who is able to do so can still sign checks and you don't require that second signature in order to, um, to make decisions. Just like the estate trustee, we often um, always advise having an alternate estate uh, power of attorney in place in case the first person that you choose can't act. Just because you name someone as your attorney doesn't mean that person has to act. They can choose not to if they're not willing to do so. The attorney for property has to make a lot of important decisions. Uh, they have to make financial decisions based on what's in the best interest of the incapable person. Uh, the attorney should consult with the in incapable person as much as possible and try to involve them in decision making as much as possible. The attorney should also make sure to encourage personal contact with the incapable person and other family members in order to keep those family members aware of what's going on. As an attorney for property, you are permitted to reimburse yourself for assets and expenses incurred, um, or sorry, from the assets for expenses that are incurred of the inc incapable person's care. And all attorneys are expected to keep accurate records of everything that they do and all of the incapable person's finances. If the power of attorney authorizes the attorney to be paid compensation, the amount is regulated by law, so they can't just take whatever they want. There are specific regulations. To avoid problems, it may be a good idea to allow family members or an accountant or a bookkeeper to review and ver verify all those financial transactions. The power of attorney for personal care uh, will set up who can make decisions with respect to your personal care. So um, you can uh, make decisions on health care, medical treatment, nutrition, shelter, um, determining whether or not the incapable person should be admitted to a long-term care facility, personal assistance services, etc. Now, if you express your wishes about your personal care prior to, prior to becoming incapable, your attorney has to follow those wishes as much as they can. If the attorney doesn't know any, any of your wishes or you haven't expressed them, the attorney has to make decisions um, from your perspective as you would have acted if you could have. Some of the decisions that they have to make um, are uh, has to be made in the best interest of the incapable person. And as I said, they have to follow the wishes as much as they possibly can if they were expressed. In determining what the best interest of the person are, the attorney should consider the values and the beliefs of the person, um, and also whether the attorney's decision is likely to improve the quality of life compared to a negative impact uh, based on a different option. Now, the legislation doesn't allow a power of attorney for personal care to accept compensation. It's only for attorney for property. But if you act as a power of attorney for personal care, you can be reimbursed for any expenses that you incur providing that care. So if you buy a, re a wheelchair um, or food or personal supplies, then the attorney can be re reimbursed for that. 
Now, some of the considerations you should make uh, when you are determining who to name as your power of attorney, do you trust the person that you're naming to manage your finances? Do you trust them to have full access to your bank accounts and to all of your money? Do you trust them to make personal care decisions for you, having regard to their age, lifestyle, health, and location? So again, if they're far away and you've appointed them to make health care decisions for you, is that going to be a burden on them and are they actually going to be able to do that? You don't have to choose the same person for your power of attorney for personal care as you do for your power of attorney for property. You can choose different people for each. The living will and the health care directive is directed to people who um, may re be responsible for your health and your welfare. So we include that in your power of attorney for personal care. So as an example, if the donor is diagnosed with an illness and death is, inevitable, uh, is an inevitable result of that illness, the donor may specify to his attorney that he only wishes to have treatment administered to him that will make him as comfortable as possible until he naturally passes away. So he may direct that he doesn't want to be kept alive by artificial means if there is no improvement to his life. A family member can't prepare an advance directive on behalf of another person, whether that person is capable or incapable. Only an individual may create an advance directive for himself or for herself. There are some limitations to healthcare directives. It can't cover all conceivable situations. Life-sustaining procedures may be necessary to increase the quality of a patient's life, and they may only be temporary. Further, if a patient over time has changed their opinion and their views with respect to their health care and what they prefer, um, what they have in their directive may not actually reflect their current beliefs at the time that that, that directive has to be engaged. A very significant limitation with respect to the health care directive is um, with respect to the patient's right to die. So most people are aware of the changes to legislation with respect to assisted suicide. That's kind of a, a, a something that's been coming up in, in recent years. The decision to end one's life can only be made by the capable person. If the person is incapable and an attorney is making decisions about personal care and health, the attorney cannot make the decision to end the life of someone else. The right to elect to take your own life cannot be delegated to someone else. So I know that was a lot of information and I hope a lot of you are still with me. Um, Today we talked about the benefit of having wills, we talked about the different ways that your beneficiaries can be cared for, whether through a trust or whether through outright gifts, um, as well as some considerations that have to be made in different situations, including for blended families or the traditional family. We also talked about the importance of having powers of attorney and what exactly those powers of attorney can do. Um, now it's very important to plan ahead and to ensure that all of your loved ones are taken care of. If you die without a will, that could cause a lot of undue stress and a lot of um, uh, difficulty among the survivors that you leave behind. Now, I'd like to use the last little bit of time to answer any questions that you have. I know that was a lot. Um, if you have any questions, please let me know and I can certainly talk to you. Yes, go ahead. What's the Ontario law regarding simultaneous death? Sorry? Simultaneous death. Uh, so if... if so if two, if two people have um, a different will, a, a husband and wife have different wills, and they both die together in a plane crash, for example, um, we would often suggest um, having a clause put into those wills saying that if we die in circumstances where it is deemed that we die together or it's difficult to determine who died first, um, then you can specify whose will is to govern in that case. So if the husband's will is different than the wife's will, uh, you can specify that the husband's will is going to dictate what happens to all of the assets in that situation. So it's not the no, no. No. Any other questions? Yes? Uh, so you can hire somebody to do that. You can have an evaluator come in and determine that. Um, as lawyers, there are things that we are attuned to and that we're aware of, um, but we, we can't necessarily give, uh, obviously, medical advice and say this person is medically incapable of making this decision. Uh, you might have to have a doctor involved to make that determination. Um, the Succession Law Reform Act actually determines um, 
uh, who actually uh, who does that and who is supposed to come in and determine what um, the sorry <laughs> to determine what um, uh, the who is going to determine who is um, capable. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yep. There's a test that you have to go through um, that that an assessor should go through to determine whether or not they have capacity. There are people who just do capacity assessments that you may want to get involved, that may have to be get involved, be involved at certain in certain situations. Um, we as lawyers can say, you know, if we meet with a client and and they have no idea what's going on or they don't know what assets they own, um, they're very loopy. They um, can't really give directions and we can determine that they're not capable to give directions and to sign their will and to fully understand what's in the will but it can be a bit of a fine line because that can come back at us if it is determined that they are capable and we refuse to do a will. Yes. Well, so it, that's a very specific question. <laughs> um, uh, so as you said, it does depend. So it depends on the relationship between those beneficiaries that you've named and their spouses or some people who are influences in, influencers in their lives. Um, if you have named your spouse, I'm just use, gonna use an RRSP as an example. If you've named your spouse as a beneficiary on an RRSP, um, once you pass away, that spouse could benefit from what's called um, a spousal rollover. So you could save taxes on that, they would be sheltered from tax consequences, and that would be dealt with outside of your estate. Um, if that spouse predeceases you, you could have named alternate beneficiaries on that asset. So you could have said, if not my spouse, then my children. But there is no uh, rollover that would be afforded to those children, so they still would have to pay tax on the RRSPs, it's only for spouses. Um, so you could do that and then the children would inherit those RSPs. Um, it may be excluded from their net family property if they were ever to get divorced, 
um, or you could have it fall to, the, to your estate. So if you're concerned about their, your children's spouses um, taking the money and making a claim against the money that they may receive from that RSP, you may want the will to deal with the RSP. So if your spouse that you've named dies, rather than naming your children, you might want to just have that RSP flow to the estate and have it divided according, with your, according to the terms of your estate. Um, in the will, we can put a provision that says anything that's inherited from the will, if beneficiaries inherit a gift on your death, that gift is to be excluded from your net family property and wouldn't be um, calculated if that beneficiary divorces from their spouse, so that wouldn't be included in what their assets are on that divorce. Um, but that's just kind of a general, general answer to that question without going into too much specific information. So you have to be clear on, on who the beneficiaries are. Sometimes a will will be valid, but the beneficiaries are not clear and they can't determine who is supposed to inherit under your estate. Um, so that in that situation, the government may step in and decide who's going to get what you've included in your estate. So I think that's all the time we have for questions. I want to thank you all for allowing me to address you today on this important topic. Um, I've got some cards. If anybody wants to grab a card and you have further questions that weren't able to be answered today, then you can certainly take a card, send me an email, give me a phone call, and I'd be happy to talk to you. Thank you very much.